Warning, the following programme contains scenes of death. It's hard to ignore the fact that children from a lower social and economical background are statistically more likely to suffer from malnutrition, child abuse, and premature death. And in the early mid-1990s, Manchester well, they were leading the way in child poverty and abuse. A beacon, if you will, of a country that while still calling itself a world power, was failing to provide for its citizens' basic needs. Case in point, me one Kellyanne Bates. And every box that had the word poor in it, her family ticked. Poor background, poor living conditions, poor genetics. You know the score. Because God has always been hardest on the poor. And I guess that there are some who would say that her card was marked from the start. But Kellyanne's journey, although charted, was in no way written in stone. If child services had stepped in, they at any time could have saved her. But with a social care record on par with India, Kellyanne Bates didn't have a prayer. Secluded area, shallow grave, less than a half mile from her car. For a candlelight vigil late last night to mourn the teenager's tragic death. Now she's safe with the angels. You want to set up or something? One of the neighbours took uh, the pot index number of the car. So, uh, so a a six. found the body yesterday morning. Uh, to people and strike them without any warning whatsoever. Oh, and then the the death uh, penalty can be placed. I was straight. Early attack. But in 1990s England, Kellyanne Bates' story was far from unique. And just another tale buried and hidden in the syphilitic shame of a nation. Because Great Britain was still heavily tied to a class system, the haves versus the have-nots. With the papers more concerned about what dress Princess Di wore to a movie premiere than if kids were going to sleep hungry or not. And for Kelly Bates and her family, it's safe to say that they were the have-nots. Raised in the shitty part of Manchester, if you could actually pick a part that is shittier than the other. And in mid-1990s, it was like pitching a tent in a hobo's asshole. In the middle of the three children, Kelly's parents divorced when she was still young. And I guess the mother was doing her best, but her best fell short. And the kids were generally left unattended, while the family survived on meager government benefits. And she spent her time hustling up another man was when Kellyanne was only 14 years old and on a babysitting job. She met what would become her destiny, and her death clock was now ticking. James Smith was as generic as his name. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, with his only defining quality being he were a filthy fucking pedophile. Divorced with a history of spousal abuse, and his last girlfriend, who was only 16 years old, left him when she was pregnant, and he'd started beating her. It was then he began sleeping with Kellyanne when he was 46 and she was only 14. By all accounts, the mental and physical abuse on the child started early. And whether or not the mother was aware of this all depends on who you want to believe. Kellyanne's mother said she protested often about her 14-year-old daughter seeing a 46-year-old man. But those protests were ignored. It was when Kelly turned 16, she left school and moved in full-time with her pedophile boyfriend. She had distanced herself from her family and her only lifeline. <laughs> Kellyanne's injuries, they never went unnoticed. But she always had an excuse for the bumps and the bruises. And everybody had to believe her. They had no choice. It was Christmas in 95 when Kelly quit her job as a cashier at a supermarket. Which many found odd, because she was the breadwinner out of the family. Her boyfriend had never worked. She then cut off all family and became unavailable. 
It was about two weeks before her body was discovered that a concerned aunt went to the couple's home, demanded to see Kelly Ann, who'd only come to the second floor window and look out. Police believe that Kelly Ann was already dead, and it was just a boyfriend pushing her up against the window. And it was two weeks later that he turned himself in, squeezing out a bucket load of tears, saying that he'd accidentally killed his beloved Kelly Ann. Liar, liar, pants on fire. When police attended the scene, they were shocked. Even for the veterans in all their years, they had never seen such brutality. With one senior officer remarking, it's as if he wanted to inflict as much pain as he possibly could while still keeping her alive. When they attended the address, she was lying naked on the bed with visible signs of decay. Smith said that she died while having an argument in the bath and she'd inhaled bath water and that he tried to revive her. Attending officers were shocked when they turned over the body to discover that the eyes were missing. They'd been gouged out and left in a coffee cup beside the bed. And along with stab wounds in her body, seems like he'd stabbed into her empty eye sockets with a knife. And when cops asked why, Smith replied, because she dared me to. And I never turned down a dare. He'd removed the eyes a month earlier and kept her tied and gagged on the bed, where he would torture and beat her and fuck her when the mood struck him. The senior pathologist said that he'd seen over 600 homicide victims and he'd never seen one with injuries so extensive. Kellyanne had virtually been starved and wasted down to nothing and had been denied water or liquids the last four days of her life with knives, forks, scissors, whatever he could find. The pathologist said it was impossible to identify one cause of death. With extensive injuries, including regularly tying her hair to a radiator and burning her with a hot iron. Smith admitted he turned himself in because he couldn't hide the smell anymore and people were noticing it. But the cops didn't need to know reason. Because the pedophile killer was going down. And he knew it. And to this day, the murder of Kelly M. Bates is a tale of shame. Of how the English government let down its most vulnerable of citizens. But the fish and chip eating variety of government aren't the only ones who let their citizens down. So do the rice and bean eating ones. Case in point. When seven year old Dora the Explorer wannabe Fatima Cecilia finished school and her mother had been held up in traffic, I guess the school figured it was a smart idea to make her wait outside alone. But mistakes happen. That's why they invented erasers, right? Wrong, because no eraser was going to help bring back what the school erased that day. Because someone was there waiting to pick up Fatima, but it wasn't a mother. And the kid disappeared into thin air. And the country was horrified that a child could be abducted in broad daylight. And I guess they all received an education that day that evil looks around every corner. And Fatima was found four days later, beaten, raped, and tortured, left in a garbage can. And after a series of other brutal murders involving children and females, the country was outraged and protests ensued. And they took their protest right to the presidential palace and the president, complaining that women and children were dying and he wasn't listening to their voices. But the president held a press conference and claimed that he was listening, but I guess he just doesn't speak Mexican. It was a week later that a man and woman were arrested. When questioned, the woman said that she had abducted the child to be her boyfriend's sex slave. She told the police at first that she didn't want to do it, but I guess her boyfriend asked her if she was a Mexican or a Mexican, and she turned out to be a Mexican. Yeah, she fell for that old trick. But either way, the two rice and bean eaters got a life sentence for murder, and I'm guessing that the prisons in Mexico aren't as nice as the ones in the U.S. There were once an egghead philosopher who said that the weak are meat and the strong eat. And I guess there's no arguing that. My only question is, when is dinner served? Case in point. 16-year-old Paula Bohovesky was a good kid. She loved theater, 
Straight A's. You know the score. And I guess she was saving herself for the right guy. Why not? She had a bright future. But sometimes the future is right here, right now. And you gotta enjoy it while it's upon you. Paula was working late at the library. After all, books. Next to acting was her second big passion. Her parents offered to come and pick her up. But she said not to bother. It was a short walk. And as she walked by a bar, she got the eye of two scumbags leaving. One of them an ex-con. They'd run out of money, so their stay at the bar were over. But after a day of drinking, they were feeling amorous. And they followed Paula. When she was almost home, Robbie McCain hit her in the head with a six-pound cinder block twice. Thinking she was dead, he dragged her into the bushes and started fucking her bush. And when it was done, he invited his buddy, Rich La Barbara, to partake. And I guess he decided he wanted to start fresh and tried to fuck her in the ass. But as he struggled to get a boner, Paula regained consciousness and looked at him, and he then pulled out a hunting knife and stuck her six times in the chest. And then he finished what he was doing, and the two losers were spotted running from the crime scene, who were arrested a short time afterwards. And Paula was found an hour later by a father who went looking for her. When word had got out to what had happened to the popular young girl, the tight-knit community were in shock. Although I'm guessing this woman didn't care too much. I mean, let's be honest here. But for the town, the frailty of life was brought to the forefront and every parent held their child closer. Both men who'd only met that day in the bar were convicted at a joint trial and given 25 to life, with their stories drastically differing, with Le Barbara claiming that he didn't try to ass fuck the girl and he certainly didn't kill her and that he was only at the scene. He'd also claimed that afterwards he'd called the police from a car box and told them that he'd witnessed a murder, but the cops told him he was too drunk and to go home and sleep it off. He then went back to the bar they'd been at and told the bartender, which could never be confirmed. McCain, on the other hand, says, yeah, sure, he hit the girl in the head with the cinder block and he fucked her, but it was La Barbara who had stabbed her to death with a hunting knife when she'd woken up when he was attempting to ask fuck her. And that's the only reason they didn't find La Barbara's jizz in the girl, because he couldn't finish his job. If you can't trust a necrophiliac ass fucking killer, then who can you trust? Either way, it was only La Barbara who seemed to show any redemption. And he was paroled in 2019, with McCain still waiting for his chance. And the whole thing was just one big mess with a beautiful life stuffed out of his prime. Being a doctor is a job that comes with respect, great responsibility, and the accolades that come with that responsibility. I guess it's safe to say that you're as closest at playing God than you'll ever get. And throughout history, there are cases of doctors who cross that line and abuse their power. But few stories even come close than the sort of tale of Dr. Jean-Claude Ramon, a doctor that kept a dark secret from his family and friends for over 18 years. But like any secret, well, you can't keep it forever. And what do you do when that secret is about to be exposed? Jean-Claude was greatly respected by friends and family, working for the World Health Organization, where he traveled the world trying to cure gook orphan diseases. You know the score, the type you get when you eat Mexican food. And I guess his family considered him a real hero, as with any a job that you gotta wash your hands more than twice a day. But the doctor liked to dabble in investments and whatnot, and considered himself a bit of a player and liked to brag how he could make friends and family rich if they handed over their life savings. And yeah, sure, he liked the good life, but he was also a family man and had two kids to support. Just an ordinary working stiff trying to make good. Oddly enough, for a doctor who traveled all around the world, Jean-Claude seemed to have a limited knowledge about the countries that he visited, and this didn't go unnoticed by family and friends. And considering he was such a financial expert, his wife had started to get calls from people angry, saying that he'd fucked them over. When she confronted her husband with this, he just laughed it off. And he said investing money was like playing the craps, and that there were winners, and there were losers. 
and that these people were just sore losers. And although she accepted this, she still felt that he was keeping secrets. But what was the good doctor's secret? To fully comprehend those secrets, we need to go back to when he was in medical school. And a bright and shiny future lay before him, because by all accounts incredibly gifted, for some reason, known only to him, he failed to take the exams in both his years at school, never becoming a doctor, surgeon, even a nurse, which I can't blame him for that, because that's a woman's job. A fact that he hid from everybody, including his parents, and it became the little lie that grew and grew. And he didn't even work for the World Health Organization. Didn't help no orphans, cure any diseases, nothing. Just one big fat lie. He got dressed every day with his doctor's get up and stethoscope, kissed his wife goodbye, then he hung out at a park or in coffee shops. And when he was supposed to be traveling all around the world curing gook orphan diseases, he'd get his wife to drive him to the airport. And when she was gone, he'd come out and book himself into a hotel across the street for a month. Then he'd spend his time reading a book on the supposed country that he'd visited so he could come back with a couple of interesting stories. To say the doctor was duplicit was an understatement. Because he'd been surviving on the money that people had given him to invest. But he wasn't investing in anything except for his own swanky lifestyle. And he'd been doing this for 18 years. But when his wife got wise to it and confronted him and said that she'd phoned the World Health Organization and they'd never even heard of him, much less hired him, Dr. Fraud knew the gig was up and he went and borrowed his father's shotgun. Then he came home that night and he beat his wife to death with a rolling pin and went to sleep beside her body. Then the next day he woke up, fed his kids breakfast, spent the day with them watching cartoons, and when they went to bed, he got a shotgun and shot them both in the head. Knowing that this would cause his parents great embarrassment, he drove over to their house and he shot them both. Even shot their beloved dog, which is fucked up in my opinion, because although we'd all like to shoot our parents at one point or another, shooting a dog? Then the killer quack went back to his place, downed a bottle of pills, set fire to the place, got back into bed with his wife, closed his eyes and waited for the reaper to come. But unfortunately, it didn't go to plan, and the frog fire department saved his snail-eating ass. And now with him half dead, and his family a bunch of french fries, it still didn't take the cops long to figure out what had happened. And when the authorities went over to the charlatan's parents' house, it looked like a retard had been eating beef bourguignon with a leaf blower. So the next time your doctor asks you to pull down your pants so he can finger fuck your sweet ass, you best ask to see his license first. Says no more.